Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're so glad that you can join us here, here being once again in Manchester, England this week, uh, as we continue on in our study, In Search of Christianity, mm. yes, looking at, in, looking at the Sermon on the Mount as the standard of what Christianity should look like. Amen. That teaching of Jesus Christ, the most radical most wonderful teaching in the history of mankind, I guarantee it. Yes. So, we last week we were talking about the, the birds of the air, uh, how God used, how Jesus spoke of them as an example of God the Father's love and provision for us, because He cares more for us than He does for the birds of the air, and yet He takes care of them. So, we're going to look on, we're going to continue on, we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 27. So why don't you open up your Bibles to that and be ready. And I suggest once again that you have a pen and paper or a pencil and paper so you can take notes, jot things down. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, as I've said over and over and over, don't take my word for anything. Test, test what me. I say. Amen. Test me. But test me according to the Word of God. Um, because as Jesus said here in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say to you, this should be transformational. It should be changing us. This is what it means when, when Paul was talking about being renewed, transformed by the renewing of our minds. The purpose of the study in the Word of God, any study in the Word of God, is to change us to be more and more like our brother Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. So before we start, I'm going to ask Alice if you would ask God's blessing upon our time together today. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we do. We come before you with hearts that are open to hear your voice. Hearts that want to live and, and speak your word only, Lord. We just thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this opportunity to share your word. And Father, we ask you to prepare the hearts to receive your word. For you alone belong the glory and the honor and the power. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. As I said, I'm going to read from Matthew. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Uh, if you're not using the New American Standard, I might suggest you use the King James or the New King James. Make sure you're using a, a literal, as close to a literal translation of the Bible as you can, all right? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single cubit to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the valley, of the lilies of the field, rather, grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. But if God so arrays the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more do so for you, O men of little faith? Matthew 6, 27-30. Being anxious, caring, all right, concerned, any word you want to put on it. Jesus is addressing the fact that his observation, remember God searches the heart, right? Yes. He's searching the heart of his people, and his observation is that they're not trusting in God the Father. Mm. If you're not trusting in God, that's a lack of faith that is displeasing to the Lord. Because without faith, you can't please Him. That's what it says. And if you're not trusting in God, you're tr trusting in someone else. And remember, as we were talking, remember this part of the study we started a couple of weeks ago, starts with His teaching about how we have to choose between trusting in and serving in the love of the Father mm -hmm. or serving mammon, mm -hmm. the riches, the wealth of this yes. world. And He showed us the value that He places on us, the birds of the air, mm -hmm. right? So it's about which one you're going to trust. And anxiety is that care. And I promise you that people who don't have money care about getting it mm, yeah. out in the world. That's right. People who have money care about losing it. That's what it means. That you'll not money won't serve you. Wealth won't serve you. You'll wind up serving it. Now consider this, and this is a verse we've probably gone over a number of times. From Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. In the parable of the sower and the seed, Jesus said, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word 
and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. It becomes unfruitful. What is the fruit? Well, you know, the fruit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what the Word of God brings to life, to bear in our lives. I want you to know that anxiety, ang you can go look at a lot of definitions you're going to find about anxiety, but test this and see if this doesn't ring true with you. Anxiety is the absence of peace that comes from the absence of faith. That's what it is. It's all about having no peace in your life. You know, it, it was interesting. I was just sharing this with somebody here. There was an article uh, in, in the U.S. News. I guess it's New Year's, U.S. News and World Report. Yesterday, mm -hmm. it was talking about a report that had been done by the World Health Organization looking at anxiety and depression in countries around the world. And the... the WHO, the World Health Organization, said that the United States of America, one of the wealthiest, certainly, mm -hmm. nations on the face of the earth, has the third highest level of anxiety and depression of any country in the world. Now, isn't it fascinating? Now, remember, we're reading something that was written 2,000 years ago, right? Yes. That Jesus notes, takes note of the anxiety that's associated with clothing. Now, you may not think of people 2,000 years ago being, being so wrapped up right. in fashion and clothing, right? But here, he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to his people. A people who recount the story of Passover each year as, as on the most holy, one of the most holy of times. And they recount this truth. Mm. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell those 40 years. Talking about the time in the wilderness. Right, right. That's Deuteronomy 8.4. So now all of a sudden, what are they, a fascist conscience? Conscious? <laughs> Let me just, I want to give you a statistic. There are not millions, no, not billions, mm -hmm. but trillions of dollars are spent annually for the new fashions offered by the garment industry. My word. <laughs> Three trillion dollars worth, worth worldwide. Now, let me tell you something. If you understood what a trillion dollars would was, you'd fall down dead, I think. I mean, it's, it's an inconceivable yeah, amount imagine. of money. Yeah. I mean, only sense. countries deal in these kinds of numbers, right? Yeah. Trillion dollars, right? Why, why is there such an anxiety about clothing? Is it to, to meet a basic need or to feed pride? There you go. Well... Why is there so much advertising about clothing? Is it there to effective uh, behavioral uh, mod Is it for modifying mod behavior. behavioral modification? Mm -hmm. Creating felt needs, mm -hmm. right? The Hebrews in the wilderness didn't have a need for clothing because yeah. their clothing didn't wear out. Right. I mean, do you replace clothing because it wears out, no. or because you saw an ad with the newest fashions? Mm -hmm. Now listen, I don't say I'm not I want to give my observation. This is not a condemnation. No, no. But it's interesting when you consider how con how fashion conscious our society yes. is. And when I say our society, I'm talking about the Western world by and large. Yes. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've had the opportunity to travel a lot in third world developing countries and seeing people there just as fashion conscious, and you wouldn't think it. Because they don't have any money. I mean, they don't, they don't you know, they, they lack a lot of the wealth that we have in the Western world. And yet they seem so concerned about how they look. They're running into stores, and more often than not, they're trying to imitate Western fashions and, and styles, clothing styles. Advertising is about, and I have some personal connection with this from mm -hmm. before I was saved, I'll tell you what. It's about creating felt needs. It's not about what you need. It's about what you think you need. Exactly. Okay? I don't know if you've ever heard of B.F. Skinner or Ernst Dichter. Mm -hmm. These are people back in, I guess, in the 50s. Skinner was one of the first behavioral psychologists. Ernst Dichter was somebody who had, he was a motivational, he had a motivational institute on how to affect people and the way they thought. 
You affect the way they think, you affect the way they act. Yes. You can affect the way they act, you'll affect the way they spend their money. All right? right. Henry David Thoreau, I don't know if you've heard of Walden Pond, right? Mm -hmm. Walden, back in the 1800s in the United States. One of the most, he is one of the most famous literature writers of, of, of the age, right? And he wrote years ago, he said, most men, or the masses, massive men, lead lives of quiet desperation. Why? Because no matter what you have, mm -hmm. it never seems to satisfy. Mm -hmm. It's never quite enough. It doesn't fill the need. It doesn't fill the need that you perceive that you have. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's the difference between a felt need and an actual need. Right. You know, if, if you are so peer pressure conscious that if you don't look like those others, if you don't have the same kind of clothing, the same kind of shoes, the same kind of dresses, mm -hmm. or that you feel pressure to fit in by having that same thing. That's not a need, no. but you may feel that as a need in your life. That's a felt need. Where does that felt need come from? Where does because you're desperate for you're desperate for not having it. Why don't you why aren't you satisfied with what God has promised? Mm -hmm. Right? Paul wrote this. To the Philippians, chapter 4, I think it's verse 19. He said, my God will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the thing that you're so desperate for isn't something you actually need. Right. You've just been convinced that you need it. Deceived. This, this started, like I said, with that talking about man. You can only serve one or the other. No man can serve two masters. You're going to trust in God or you're going to trust in the world and the riches of the world. But Paul wrote to the Romans. I'm going to read Romans 6, 16. Okay. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Don't you understand that you, when, when you have that kind of pressure to have those things that are the modern things to fit in with other people, to f or to feed your pride, mm -hmm. or to keep your self-esteem up. You've been enslaved. You're not acting out of your best interest. In fact, you're acting out of what other people think of you, or what you right. perceive that people will think of you. Are you, are you a slave? Well, you know... People don't like the word slavery, but the fact of the matter is, it says in the scriptures that you're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of righteousness. It says in verse 18 in Romans 6, and having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Of righteousness. You're either a slave of sin mm -hmm. or you're a slave of righteousness. Right. But you're going to serve somebody. That's, That's what right. Jesus was saying at the beginning of this, what we're talking about, right? You were, listen, we all were. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.26, and he said, and they were supposed to pray that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive to him to do his will. When you are bound by the need for these things, the anxiety, the concern for these things, the latest fashions, the latest styles, the things that will you perceive will make you fit in with the crowd, You've been held captive. Yes. You're enslaved to that. You're not free. Why do you care about these things? Why does it matter to you? Why do you have to have the latest fashions? Why do you have to have the latest shoes? Why do you have to have a hundred... Remember it was Mel DeMarcos over in the Philippines years ago? Mm. The no her, shoes. I mean, she so had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pairs of shoes when they finally found out, right? And when you go after these fashions, you end up looking like everybody else. Nobody's an individual. Yeah, so you're, so you're unique. <laughs> you look right. like, exactly like everybody else. I want you to know... But you are unique. ...that there is a conspiracy here. We're dealing with a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not the commies. It's not the Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's not the rich. It's not the Illuminati or the Masons. They're just dupes. Mm -hmm enslaved tools to the work of the devil. Jesus made it clear when he said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10. Satan is a thief. Yes. There's a conspiracy, but it's Satan. 
you know, Paul wrote to the Ephesians and said, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6, 12. Satan wants to deprive you of the abundant life that Christ gave, came to give you. But that abundant life is not about having the shiniest new car, the biggest house, the latest clothes hanging in your closet. Abundant life is about your relationship with him. And the way you deal with this, it's a battle. And I, I know it's a battle. But that's, again, Paul wrote to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 said, For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What's the weapon of our warfare? The sword of the word. Amen. You have to be equipped with the word of God and take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. If you're not taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, well, where do you think your thoughts come from? Oh, I'm a very original, creative person. No, you're not. Only God is creative, by the way. That's right. Only God is creative. Mm -hmm. Christians aren't creative. We just, we just have been entrusted with the Word of God, and the Word of God is creative. Right. Okay? Satan is the enemy. The helmet of salvation is what protects a mind that is set on God. That's what it says, right, in yes. Ephesians? And Paul is talking about the whole armor of God, so we're not to be unaware of the wiles, the schemes of the devil. Right. The wiles. You know, wiles is a, a term we don't hear much anymore in our modern English language, but that has to do with seduction. Mm. And he's trying to seduce you. The enemy is trying to, Satan is trying to seduce you into desiring these things. Mm -hmm. When you don't need them. Because he's telling you that if you have them, then you'll have abundant life. You won't even have life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right? For those so who. What you'll end up having is cares. You'll have cares. And the, the other word for cares is anxiety. You'll, you'll have anxiety in your life. And anxiety comes because of a lack of faith. Right. You're not trusting in God to supply the things that you need. And if it, He will supply the things you need, He'll determine the things that you need. Amen. If He's not determining the things that you need, who is? Well, I'm going to read from Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And that's what it's about. That's what it's all about. Pleasing so God. if you don't have that helmet of salvation, where do your thoughts come from? Honestly, I mean, I want you to think about this. Let me, we're here in England, so, but I'm going to relate to something, uh, the American Super Bowl. I'm familiar with American football and the American Super Bowl. In this past year, I guess it's in February? Is, was so, in February? Yeah. It used to be January. People pay, companies pay to advertise at the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl is one of the, one of the most watched events on television yes. in the United States. Well, in this past year, 30-second advertising spot, mm -hmm. the cost of that was $5 million. For 30 seconds. Just for the time, for 30 seconds. Not counting production. And companies spent millions of dollars more to produce the ads mm -hmm. that they spent the $5 million to show, to get into yes. your head for 30 seconds. So you can say all you want. Well, I'm not affected by those, that, oh, those advertisements. Yes. Do you honestly think that these companies would spend millions and millions of dollars of their money, which is their great treasure, to get into your brain for 30 seconds if they didn't believe that it worked? And trust me, in the advertising industry, they have had behavioral psychologists on staff for a long, long time figuring out exactly what it takes to manipulate your mind. And that's the correct term. They're manipulating your mind. Satan comes to steal your love, your joy, your peace, 
He wants you to be focused on self-esteem mm. rather than your value. Self. Jesus wants you focused on your value. We talked about this. What is your value? You were purchased with a price. God the Father Jesus. paid Jesus Christ to redeem you. Self-esteem, who cares what you think of yourself? The only thing that matters is what God thinks of you. And if you've been convinced otherwise, you have been lied to, and you will never have that fullness of life. If you're buying clothes to be esteemed by your peers, so you think that they're like, yeah, they're not going to like you any better anyhow. Right? Jesus was not even impressed by Solomon's riches. Riches that he had that were a gift from God, all right? Where, did he not get them from you? Absolutely. All right? He said, Behold, I have done according to your words. Solomon. This mm -hmm. is God speaking to Solomon. Mm -hmm. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before, nor shall, mm -hmm. some, no, shall one like you arise after you. I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. That's right. But remember what it said back there when Jesus started here? Mm -hmm. I, I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory did not clothe himself like one of these. Right. It was all about Solomon's glory. That's right. You know what? If you're focused on your glory, you're going to miss out on God's glory. And if you miss out on God's glory, I promise you, you will miss out on the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. Right? So Jesus continues on, Matthew 6, 31. Do not be anxious then, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? With what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles eagerly seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Since the Lord himself declared that these particular things are needs, then you can, should understand when Paul said what he said, and stand fast on this, yes. that God will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory. He doesn't supply your needs through the world's riches, mammon, mm -hmm. but according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. You can't tell him how. So how much of your prayer life is about telling God what you want and how he should do it? Honestly, I mean, you know, it says let a man examine himself. Stop and think about it. When the Lord supplies our basic needs, then we shall be satisfied. For Paul wrote to Timothy again. I'm going to read 1 Timothy 6, 8, and he says, for if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. And it is. It is content. If you got a pencil and paper, <laughs> write this down. Not my words. Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom yes. and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, 33. The plan is, if you seek God, you seek his kingdom, you seek his righteousness, his promise to you is he'll take care of all the things that you need. That's the commentary. Do you remember the sermon? It started when we started on the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. God wants you satisfied. You'll never, have, you'll never get to that place where you don't have anxiety and concern and care in your life. And you don't believe that money is going to be the answer. That's what chokes the word of God in your life. That's why I read that from you, right? That chokes the word of God in your life. Mm -hmm. But first of all, and you can't put up walls until you put up a foundation. Right? You've got to have a foundation. And Christ is both, he is the cornerstone and he is the foundation. Mm -hmm. He is the rock. And, and that has to go first. Mm -hmm. Because he says later on, and we'll get to this in, in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Close in Matthew 7 26, he said, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. Matthew 7 26. You know, Alice and I were missionaries. We lived in Belize, Central America. And I remember seeing them build houses and they built it on, on shaky ground. Yes. I remember it was one big project there out on the northern highway, highway. on yes. the road, yes. Highway is not what you're thinking of. And, and this whole, they built this thing, it was magnificent. Great big building. And all of a sudden, you go by it every day and it would be a little lower. I mean, it became, it was useless. Because it's, it was built on sand. 
and it was built without a foundation, right? So one end was sinking, and the other one was so it was yes. crooked, <laughs> very crooked. And that's what will happen to your life if you don't build your life on a solid foundation, mm -hmm. on the rock, on that cornerstone. Amen. In Matthew 6.34 it says this, So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? Amen. Don't be anxious. Don't be concerned. It appears to me, by the observation of my decades in the ministry and travels around the world, that most people either live in the past or in the future. Living the glory days of, of yesteryear, living on memories of what happened, or living on their hopes for what's going to yes, happen tomorrow. To be. And they miss today. And you know there's an old saying, tomorrow never comes. It's always, it's always tomorrow. It's always a, right. isn't that a song. Yeah. It's always a day away. Right? God wants you to enjoy today. Otherwise, you're not going to have that fullness of life. Okay? Don't worry about yesterday. Paul said... You know, writing in Philippians again, chapter 3, he said, forgetting what lies behind, I press on towards the goal. You can't change what happened. You can't change what happened yesterday. No. If you want to remember something about yesterday, remember the things that God has done. Amen. And you should have a testimony about what God has done in your life. Okay? For us, for the redeemed, our past is the testimony that we have, or the testimony of those who have gone on before us. Right? right? Our past is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our yesterday is Moses and David and Peter and Paul. That's our past. Hallelujah. That, and that's, if you're going to recall something from the past, remember that. It says in Proverbs 27, 1, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. That's right. You have no assurance to, about tomorrow. You don't. One moment to the okay? next. You don't know. Hallelujah. Life on this old planet is fragile. Don't trust in tomorrow, okay? Live life to the fullest today. And remember, it says in Psalm 34, 19, many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. Thank you. One of the things you can do, and this is that paradox that others can't do, you can remember your future. Yes. How can you remember your future? It's been written. <laughs> because your future is accomplished. It has been written. Jesus said in John 14, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place, a dwelling place for you, a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hallelujah. John 14, 1 through 3. Yes. And then he goes on. Two verses later, in verse 27, he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Praise God. God wants you free from the fears, from the yes. anxiety, from the cares and concerns of this world. Because fear will And you can remember you. what yeah. lies ahead of you. That's right. That great promise. So fix your mind. Set your mind on the things above. Hallelujah. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, yes. not on the latest fashions. And Father, we just thank you for what you have done in our lives, what you're doing in our lives, and for what you're yet to do in our lives through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Well, until next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish not all. Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to that old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown